Hello and welcome to the latest episodes of Analyzing Anfield from the Liverpool Echo. I'm Beth Lindop and I've got Kiefer MacDonald alongside me to dissect all the talking points from Liverpool's last two outings in the Premier League. Now, before we get stuck into Arsenal's win over Liverpool, unfortunately, and Liverpool's win over Burnley, how are you, Kiefer? Are you still confident that, that Liverpool have got what it takes to, to compete on four fronts this season? I am, yeah. It's been a Jekyll and Hyde few weeks, hasn't it, since we did, did the first pod. Um, plenty to talk about, two contrasting performances. Um, but I suppose, you know, sign of champions is, you know, you can't play 10 out of 10 every week, can you? You can only, you know, you, you can only kind of beat what's in front of you. And I think Liverpool did that against Burnley, got back to winning ways, top of the Premier League as it stands. So, uh, you know, what happens between now and the season, I'm sure it'll be an exciting, nervous, um, you know, a couple of months, but plenty to play for, that's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And and just for anyone who, who's not sure what, what the, the standings of the, the Premier League table are at the moment, Liverpool are two points clear at the top, two points clear of City, who have a game in hand, and two points clear of Arsenal as well. Um, and I think that probably, the, the fact that, that that buffer between Liverpool and Arsenal is so small now probably points to the fact that it was a, the Arsenal game was a, was a must win for them, wasn't it? I think if they hadn't have won that, Liverpool would have gone eight points above them, and that would have been Arsenal's hopes of, of winning the title pretty much snuffed out wouldn't it but it, it was overall just a really bad performance from Liverpool do you think that that's all it was just a, a bad day at the office yeah absolutely I mean you know the, the second goal I think is the one that changes the game and it's such an uncharacteristic mistake isn't it from Virgil van Dijk and Alisson Becker but even before that I, I didn't think Liverpool I have to be honest I thought their best spell was in the second half at the start of the second half maybe 10 or 15 minutes I think Curtis Jones went close with, with a chance at you know curling into the far corner but Prior to that, I mean, they had one shot on target. I think we've got a few stats here. They recorded their lowest XG of the season by, by some way as well. It was 0.4, which, you know, for one shot on target is is, is pretty pretty poor. Um, and they just didn't really get going. I thought Arsenal had a real grip on midfield and, and Liverpool struggled. Um, I don't think Trent Alexander-Arnold was fit. I think you could you could tell. And obviously he gets hooked off before the hour mark. Um, and you could also see as well that Joe Gomez was doing that inverted role. So I think, you know, as well as losing Salah, so obviously the effort of Cup of Nations and then injury, um, and then obviously Trent Alexander-Arnold not being fit, and then kind of the, the onus being on Joe Gomez to kind of be that creative spark in midfield. We, I, I just think Liverpool struggled and, as I say, never really got going. And, and Arsenal, to their credit, as you say, it was, you know, a, a, a kind of a bigger game, a biggest game of their season, really. Um, you know, no titles are won in February, of course, but... I think you can lose a title in February and I think you just have to look at Arteta's celebrations at full time and the, the celebrations of Odegaard and, and kind of the rest of the Arsenal teams as, as to, to kind of see how much it meant to them. And I think that's a, a, a kind of a, a timely reminder of how Liverpool are viewed by the rest of the Premier League. They, they, they still are the team to beat you know they they weren't that last season but they've they've really bounced back this season. It was only the, the second defeat of, of you know of the Premier League uh, season so far. So I think if, if Liverpool had won that, I mean, I actually said to one of my mates going down there that if Liverpool had, had beaten Arsenal, I think that would have you know, not been one hand on the trophy, but Arsenal certainly would have been out of the race. And then all of a sudden you're circling that game against City on the 10th of March and thinking you can you can get one hand on the trophy then. But I think now it's just made it a little bit more interesting. And then, you know, Arsenal have obviously thrashed West Ham on Sunday. So, you know, as I say, plenty to play for. But I don't think I don't think anything's lost for Liverpool yet. They're still in a good position. It's still technically in their own hands if, if they do go on to beat City. I mean, it's going to be a, similar to 2019 and 2022 in terms of it's going to have to be a near perfect, you know, 14 game run. But Liverpool are capable of putting big runs together and winning big trophies. So, you know, let's just let's just see what happens. Yeah, big few months ahead then. Um, I think, as you say, the frustration, well, there was a few frustrations. I think one one is that, you know, two of, of Liverpool's standout performers, not just this season, but over the past five, six years, Alison Becker and Virgil van Dijk conspired to make probably the, the biggest defensive yeah. error of the season and in, in arguably Liverpool's biggest game of the season. So that was that was where a lot of the frustration came from. I think also the fact that it was almost a little bit predictable. I think if you go back to, to Liverpool's win over Arsenal at the Emirates in, in the FA Cup, tactically, I think Arsenal set up fairly similarly to, to the way that they did. And there was a lot of similarities in, in the manner of, of the way the game started. I think Arsenal obviously came out strong, as you would expect. Yeah. Obviously, they had the crowd right behind them um, and they had a you know a few big big opportunities in, in the first 15 20 minutes and the, the difference um, against Arsenal in, in the Premier League compared to to in the FA Cup was that Arsenal took one of those chances through Bukayo Saka um, and and then obviously as you say that second goal for Arsenal does change the game but just having a look at a few stats from from that game and um, because I think it really does highlight how lacklustre Liverpool were and um, so 
Arsenal regained possession inside the final third on eight occasions compared to Liverpool's one, um, which I think really indicates how aggressive Arsenal were off the ball as well. And that's something that, that Jurgen Klopp's teams have been hailed for in the past, their, their ability to press and, and force the opposition into turnovers and to making mistakes. And I don't think Liverpool did that. I think those stats indicate that. Um, as a team, Arsenal ran 116.8 kilometres, which was one which was 6.1 rather kilometres further than Liverpool which again that's something that Liverpool have always been very good at you know James Milner alone in the <laughs> probably, in, covered, that himself, yeah, probably covered that himself so it was quite a it was quite a meek attacking performance from Liverpool like you said they, they didn't get a shot on target until the 62nd minute um, and even though sort of XG doesn't always sort of paint the, the full picture of a, of a game um, they conceded 3.5 to XG, which was the highest XG conceded by Liverpool in the Premier League on record, which again highlights Arsenal's dominance and perhaps the fact that Liverpool didn't put them under enough pressure. Um, a lot of the issues did seem to stem, though, from from midfield. I mean, as we've as you touched on earlier on, you know, they didn't have a full complement of players at their disposal. Um, Dominic Savoslai's injury before the game sort of threw a bit of a spanner of the, in the works and, and Ryan Gravenberch was given the nod over Harvey Elliott. Do you think that was a strange choice, putting putting him in instead of Elliott? I think in hindsight, yes, because of obviously, obviously we'll get onto the Burnley game shortly. Um, but I think it's been a really different, uh, difficult season side for, for Ryan Gravenberch, and that's completely understandable. I mean, he's still, he's, he's 20, what is he, 23 years of age. He's, he's still really young. Um, 21, 21, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, might be a bit younger, actually. Sorry, 21. Um, and... You know, he hardly didn't play a lot of football at Bayern Munich last season. Um, I think he only played, you know, nine hundred odd minutes or so. He had no preseason really. I think Bayern Munich it was, it was quite obvious where he wasn't part of their plans under Thomas Tuchel. So he was kind of, you know, spent the whole season, uh, the preseason in limbo. And not only that, he didn't get a preseason under Jurgen Klopp at all. You know, he joins on deadline day, and you know that's difficult for any player joining a new club. But I think at that age, joining, you know, one of the most demanding leagues in the world and playing on under one of the most intense coaches in the world is always going to take its toll. Um, and funny enough, actually, for the for the first goal, I thought the pressing of the midfield just just wasn't there. And I thought Gravenberch in particular, I, I think it's it's Jota who goes to press and Gravenberch doesn't really follow it up and he kind of gets caught in two minds and then all of a sudden Odegaard's free and then Havertz makes like a third man run from midfield. So it was just kind of all over the shop from Liverpool. Um, and I think, as I say, uh, there's a few stats here that I've got. I mean, um, out of all Liverpool starters, only Cody Gappo had fewer touches than Ryan Gravenberch. I think he had 10 in the first half, which is which is almost understandable as a forward. I mean, he, there, was, there was little to no service. I mean, the only chance that Liverpool created really was, as, if you want to call it a chance, was was obviously Diaz for his own persistence and caused his own goal. Um, Gravenberch had 24 touches. I mean, for comparison, um, Elliot had 28 in the final half an hour and Thiago played you know, the best part of 10 minutes and had 10 touches himself. So that kind of shows how, how little involvement Ryan Gravenberch had and, and how much he struggled. Um, in, in terms of long term, I don't think that it's something to be too worried about because we've, we've seen you know better players than him like Fabinho struggle initially and, and how demanding it is to play in a Jurgen Klopp midfield and eventually they, they come out the other side all the better for it. Um, but I just think the way... You know, you mentioned the injuries to Sir Bosley, and then you know you take into account that Trent Alexander-Arnold wasn't playing in his kind of usual inverted role um, in that game. There was there was a big onus on, on you know the midfield to be extra creative, and and certainly the the kind of the links that Liverpool have had down the right hand side over the last few years. You know, you're looking at Salah as, as the kind of the focal point. Um, you know, you're looking at previously a Jordan Henderson. You know, Harvey Elliott's played that right centre midfield role as well, and you've got Trent. So there's been a nice kind of triangle on that side, which which has been you know really key to Liverpool's success, which they just didn't have um, against Arsenal. Uh, I thought you know McAllister was was kind of the man trying to glue it all together. I thought he was, he was probably Liverpool's best performer on the day, but apart from that, it was just really dysfunctional. And as as you say. Arsenal did a really good job of making the pitch compact, which, you know, Liverpool, there was no space for McAllister to receive the ball between the lines and get creative. And that kind of stifles, you know, Gakpo, who's, you know, when he plays, he, he likes to drop deep. So there was, I, th I think to Arsenal's credit, um, I mean, a lot of people will point to the second goal and say it was Liverpool's own undoing, but I did think Arsenal were really good value f for their win. Um, I thought they were, they were impressive at Anfield before Christmas. I know Liverpool probably should have won that game with the chances they had in the second half. Um, but just in terms of, you know, what you, what you kind of associate with, with Arsenal over the last 10 years has been, you know, quite weak, not really having a spine, not really standing up to the challenge. And I think in the three games against Liverpool this season, they've obviously been the better team over over the three. Um, so there's no, you know, they, they will be there or thereabouts at the end of the season. I'm not sure they'll, they'll end up going on to win it. I think there's probably too much emotion involved with Arsenal. But 
it's certainly not there's certain no, no disgrace in losing at the Emirates. I mean, better teams will go there and lose. So it's just one that Liverpool, you know, they did dust themselves down and, and they moved on to Burnley and got the three points. Yeah, not not a fan of the the other and the the taking <sighs> photographs on no, the pitch kind not, of celebration. Not so. for me, and not not in February, and and not to sound like your dad or anything. But <laughs> I mean, as I say, there's no league titles or one in February, and I just think, you you know, fair enough. Uh, you know, lap it up, enjoy it with the fans. You know, walk around the pitch, applaud everyone. But I just thought it was a bit, a bit much. And I mean, Arteta, I think everyone's kind of noticed his antics on the touchline over the last couple of years. I think they've slowly, he slowly kind of, kind of stepped over the mark. I think as an ease. I mean, he's ironically he always steps out of his technical area, and he never seems to be kind of controlled. And and as I say, his reaction for Trossard's third goal. I mean, he he started high fiving the fans like he was some kind of West End performer. So it was all just a bit a bit weird. But as I say, I think Arsenal would be there or thereabouts at the end of the season. Yeah, I mean, I suppose to, to play devil's advocate, you could argue that, that Jurgen Klopp ran onto the pitch, couldn't you, in, in that in that Merseyside derby win? Though, but it, 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 yeah, it's, 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 it's different. And everyone's going to have contrasting opinions on it. Um, but I do sort of agree. I think at Arsenal, for me, are probably third in, in a three-horse race, really, um, in terms of the title race. Um, but whatever, whatever you thought of the, their antics on the pitch at the end of the game, I think you've got to give them a lot of credit for the way they did set up, for the way that Arteta set them up tactically. I think they had quite, a, as you say, quite a compact midfield, a box midfield, and I think with with Kai Havertz obviously has had a little bit of a turbulent time since joining the club in in the summer but he played in that left channel Odegaard in the right channel and that sort of left Alexis McAllister who, who like you say probably was was Liverpool's best performer on the day he was constantly then faced with a decision about who to close down and I think that that made it very difficult um, because McAllister is so often the one who can sort of play Liverpool out of a tight space and and, and set them on the front foot so um so I think they deserve credit for that um and but I think it is really important what you said as well about that dysfunctional element of, of the right side because we're so used to Liverpool having a strong right side over you know under Jurgen Klopp and, and Gravenberch, Gakpo and, and Trent Alexander-Arnold that was the first time that they'd all combined on the right wasn't it so you know you could you could tell and I think it wasn't the Trent Alexander-Arnold that we're all used to he clearly was carrying a knock we saw that him going off at the weekend against Burnley and hopefully that's not too serious um, just going back to, to Graven Birch then, because he did get a lot of criticism, perhaps slightly unfair. I mean, he did have a part to play in Liverpool's equaliser. There yeah. was obviously, you know, an element of fortune there and, and it was in part as well down to, to Luis Diaz's tenacity as well. But um, just a, a little look at him because because there have been glimpses of, of real promise. And I, I think maybe part of, of the reason he gets a lot of criticism is because people don't realise how young he is. I mean, he is 21. You know, but... I think he's 23, <laughs> it's so all it's your fault, Keeper. <laughs> um, but in, in 2018, he became the youngest ever player to play in, in, in the Dutch first tier. Um, he was passing the record set by, by Clarence Seedorf, which, I mean, if he turns out to be half the player that he was, <laughs> then Liverpool will be very happy indeed. Um, but he's been around for, for a long time. Like I say, he was 16 when he made that debut. Um, and he, you know, he, he has been around for, for a little while. And I think people maybe think he is older than he is. Um, but he made only three Bundesliga starts last season. Um, so you, you can understand why there have maybe been a few slight teething problems. Um, but one stat that I did think was quite interesting was compared to the other central midfielders who've operated in that number eight role for Liverpool this season, Gravenberch has the lowest pressures per 90. So that's maybe sort of indicative of the fact that he's not quite up to speed with what playing in a, in a Jurgen Klopp midfield demands of him. But but you, you mentioned Fabinho there earlier on, Andy Robertson as well. Some players do come into a Jurgen Klopp side and take a little bit of time to find the feet. Do you think that's sort of what the cases here yeah absolutely i mean as you said there's, there's been flashes and there's kind of been glimpses where you think you know there's a real player in here and you know you don't set those records at a club like ajax with a, an academy like ajax if you aren't a, a really good player i think what's interesting is five of his eight premier league starts have been at anfield so it kind of ties into that narrative of, is he he's not fully you know up to up to scratch with maybe the, the not not the tactical demands but maybe the physical demands and, and maybe not disciplined enough to to be trusted away from home as, as some of the others are you know you look at sabozla who's an you know an experienced bundesliga player an experienced international um so he's just he's kind of been ahead of him and gravenberch has, has been the the kind of europa league slash league cup kind of you know, FA Cup as well, operator. Um, but I mean, I mean, earlier in the season against Everton at Anfield, I thought he was really good. Um, but there's, there's so often in games that I think his decision making does let him down at times. You know, he'll, he'll drive with the ball from deep and he'll have options left and right. And he's almost, you know, like a cat in headlights. He doesn't know which one to pick. And then in the end, he picks neither. And then Liverpool lose possession. And it's like, you know, he does 70% of the, the, the hard work. And then he kind of lets himself down with the, with the easier, easier decisions. But 
I mean, he is a, a really talented player. I mean, if you were to, to kind of mould a midfielder of what you'd want, you know, technical, um, you know, he's obviously big and strong. He can he can hold his own. He's he's happy to receive the ball in deeper positions. He can also drive with it as well from from more advanced position. And and as we saw against Arsenal, he's got an eye for a pass into the final third. So I think he's he's a really handy tool that, you know, that well, not Jürgen Klopp now, but whoever the next Liverpool manager can have a lot of fun with and, and almost mould into to whatever they want. Um, but I just think this first season is going to be one where it's it's sometimes one step forward, two steps back with him. Um, but you know you've got to think this is that time when Sabozla is injured. Um, you know, as I say, Salah's not been there on the right hand side either, and Trent's had his problems. So it's kind of like the biggest game of the season. Liverpool had none of their kind of facilitators around him, which obviously makes his job ten times harder. Um, so I do have sympathy with him in that regard. Um, but you know, I think as as we both said, Beffy, I think there's certainly a player to to, to player in there. Um, you know, he wasn't just bought for this season, he was bought for the you know the next four, five, six years, hopefully. So and no doubts that he will come good and hopefully we'll start to see that after a full preseason and a full summer at Liverpool. Yeah, definitely. And he obviously came in for a price that in today's transfer market is, is probably fairly reasonable as well. So you would like to think that Liverpool will get good return for, yeah. for that money that they spent. I mean, I know Joe Rimmer, who on yesterday's Blood Red podcast was called by a, by one of our viewers an LFC hater, <laughs> um, has criticised Graham Birch a few times this season. Um, and, and sort of similarly to, to what you said, there are times when he sort of holds onto the ball maybe a little bit too long and, and you just sort of want him to release it. Yeah. But that's something that hopefully will come with with age. Um, we've got a couple of comments here from Ride Shortgun on YouTube. YouTube, um, who says massively underwhelming performance at the Emirates, tiny improvements in the Burnley game, but still conceding too, way too many chances. I mean, we'll get onto the Burnley game shortly. Um, but he also says that Connor Bradley was missing in that game, only highlighted how much we need to move away from playing Trent Alexander Arnold right back. I mean, that is the age old debate, isn't it? Yeah. Where does Trent belong? And I think the emergence of Connor Bradley has really made people think actually that we could have a, a real world-class right back here that might facilitate Trent moving further forward. I mean, we won't get fully into all of that now, but just sort of having seen Connor Bradley, obviously he's been absent for, for compassionate reasons. And obviously that the, the most important thing is that he spends some time with his family. And Jürgen Klopp said, you know, it's completely up to him. He comes back when he's ready, but having seen what he can do, you know, in in the, in the last few games before before obviously his father passed away, would you be keen to to have him at right back and and try Trent a bit further forward? It's difficult, isn't it? I mean, prior to Bradley, I'd always been in the camp of you know Liverpool had won the lot, they'd won the Premier League with with the highest of a points total, or they tallied you know like three of the highest of a points totals, they'd won a Champions League, you know they literally won everything in the land with with Trent Alexander Arnold at right back. So it was like if that's the level that Liverpool need to get back to, or they aspire to get back to, you know the, the teams would be in Europe and across the world. Then why would you change something that was so influential first time around? But I suppose you know there's th this debate will come up again now, especially not only because of Conor Bradley's um, uh, you know emergence, but also be because there's a new manager in here who's going to be you know able to kind of stamp his own ideas on the team but I mean it's so it's early days to, to judge Bradley isn't it I mean he's he's uh funny enough actually I watched him a few years ago at the academy I think it was 2020 or 2021 I spoke to Mark Bridge Wilkinson after and and he basically said that like if he wants to play in midfield you know he can he can dominate a game like this was at a time when Trent was was there was a lot of debate around Trent and he basically said if you know if Trent can do it he can do it kind of thing he's he's kind of cut from a similar cloth and at the time you hear that and you're like oh, you know he's a he's a 18 year old kid or whatever you know he, he'll probably kind of just disappear and you won't hear about him but having you know watched him closely in his development you can you can see why he's so confident in the on the ball um and he, he's just so relentless isn't he in going forward i mean that came against chelsea and and even the norwich run a few days before um the amount of times he won the ball on the halfway line and he, his first thought was to drive forward not to to look you know for a more senior player to pass the ball to and think oh can i play a cheap one too or whatever he was like you know i've got the ball there's acres of space i'm going to drive into it and i suppose if, if you know if you are looking at someone like alonso who has you know, there's a lot of emphasis kind of put on his fullbacks and the demands of them, then maybe it would suit, um, you know, Bradley to, to be kind of that player. Um, because Trent, obviously, is coming inside more. I think I think Alonso, from kind of what I've seen, is he likes his fullbacks to be kind of high and wide. Uh, so that, you would think, would suit Bradley more. But in, in terms of Trent between now and the end of the season, I, I mean, as I say, there's going to be massive games, and I just don't think we'll conflict between the two. I mean, you know, you're looking at City at Anfield next month. Would you throw Connor Bradley into that? I mean, it's a huge call, isn't it? If, if that doesn't go well, then you're going to have to change again to, to kind of Trent's at fullback. So if it was me, I, I think, you know, Trent's at the minute, he's uh, he's injured and he, it sounds like he's not going to be back too soon. Um, so I think between now and the end of the season, it, it might just be a case of like rotating the, the two at right back. And 
as I say, Liverpool are going to have some really big games and they're also going to have less important games in, in the Europa League coming up. So maybe that's where Bradley gets his minutes and in the later rounds of the FA Cup as well. And then maybe Trent is your man for, for Premier League duty. And, and look, if it's if Liverpool need a goal on, on 60 minutes, 70 minutes, as they've done at times this season, I mean, I think of the Fulham game in December where you know they're chasing the game, they're 3-2 down and Klopp sticks Trent in midfield. So they can do that at the time he brought Gomez on. But, you know, if you are a goal or two down, you can you can bring an attacking fullback on in Bradley and, and put Trent in midfield. So I think there's plenty of options, but I won't be looking to shake anything up, you know, too soon in the short term. I just think Liverpool are probably best off sticking sticking with what they know. And I think Trent is still the best in the business by far, wherever he plays. He's just one of those players where he just kind of gravitates towards the ball and makes things happen. You know, if you play him in goal, he'd probably get two assists a game. So um, I don't think there's too much to worry about in terms of where they're playing. I think it's just nice to have to have options and depth, really, because we haven't we've we've never seen that, have we? Um, you know, especially whilst Trent's been in the team. So yeah, really, really a positive to be fair. Yeah, and I don't think it's any coincidence that Liverpool in, in the last two games when Trent Alexander Arnold clearly has been carrying a knock, hasn't been fully fit, yeah. obviously goes off at half time against Burnley. I don't think it's any coincidence that Liverpool have looked poorer for it and I think they'll be you know, they'll be really benefiting for from when he is back and, and fit, which touch wood will not be too soon. Uh, will will not be not too, too long. not be too far away. <laughs> too as soon as as soon as possible, please. Um but just sort of wrapping up then on, on the Arsenal game, I mean it is frustrating. It's frustrating to lose, you know, in the manner that Liverpool did. Probably the first game they've deserved to lose this season. Um, when you go back to all the controversy that came with the the, the Tottenham defeat, um, do you think Liverpool can take too much from it, or is it just one of those games where they've just got got a sort of brush it off as a, as a bad day at the office? I mean, I, I just want to have a little look about um, how Liverpool have fared against the the rest of the the so called big six this season. I mean, I know Chelsea have not quite <laughs> shown the the big six credentials so far this season, although they, they did get a quite quite a, an impressive win against Palace last night. Um, but Liverpool have played seven, won one and drawn drawn four and lost two against the fellow big six this season. So they've got seven points from those seven games. By contrast, Manchester City have played five, won one, drawn three, lost one. So they've got six points from five games. Arsenal have played six, won three and drawn three. So they've got 12 points. So Arsenal obviously doing the best out of those three candidates in the race for the title, which is interesting considering they're actually in, in the worst place at this moment in time yeah. in, the, in the title race. I mean, do you think Liverpool will be too concerned about that or do you think Think they'll just be thinking you know what we beat City at Anfield we put in a good good performance away against against Manchester United we beat Tottenham at home and and then you know we don't really need to worry about what's gone before well, that, well, that's it, isn't it? I mean, the, the games they've got left are, are quite favourable. I think people forget how hard Liverpool's running in, in the I say running, well, kind of how hard Liverpool's fixtures were in the, in the first half of the season. You know, they start at Stamford Bridge, they go to Tottenham soon after, um, they, they go to the Etihad a few weeks after that. So that sets the running up quite nicely. Normally, typically, you know, 2019 and 2022, when Liverpool are going for the title, it feels like they always have City to come. Uh, sorry, they always have to go to City in the second half of the season. And I don't think you can can underestimate how, uh, you know, influential it is um, having City to come to, to Anfield for a change, which, as I say, it feels like it's always the other way around. And it's almost like, you know, you're within touch and distance, you're maybe a point or two behind them. And then it's like, we've got the Etihad and, you know, Liverpool's record there. I mean, they've only won once there under Jurgen Klopp. So it almost feels like, well, you might as well sacrifice another three points. So um, I think the, the fact that Liverpool have kind of negotiated these top six fixtures this year, I mean, they haven't done as well as they, they, they've done in previous years. Um, but I think they've been more consistent in their, in their other games. I mean, as you mentioned, Beth, it was only their second defeat of the season, which is, you know, if you kind of disregard the first one, given the circumstances, it is an, an incredible run that Liverpool have been on since, what, last April when they lost at City and they've really transfer, transformed their, their kind of fortunes around. But I, I don't think there's any underestimating how important it is to beat those in and around you. But as I suppose, you know, Tottenham to come out on field, that'll be another big game. I think that's at the start of May and, and they've got City to come in a few weeks. And, and then I think probably the only one you're looking at after that is, uh, well, it depends how Villa will hold up, but you've, you've got United to come, which is, you know, if you kind of ignore the results, the, the kind of freak 5-0. I think Liverpool have always found it quite difficult to go to Old Trafford on the clock. It feels like they've, they've always played the, the team rather than, the, the, sorry, played the club rather than the team. Um, but I think that will be key. They'll have to, you know, certainly win at least two of those um, if, if they are to to go on and win the Premier League and it's, I suppose it's, as I say it's just reassuring that at least they can they know if they put a, together a perfect run it is theirs but I suppose it's easier said than done isn't it yeah absolutely I mean only time will tell uh, we'll move on then to, to the Burnley game Liverpool obviously 3-1 winners in that one I mean you said earlier on Kiefer that it's been a bit of a Jekyll and Hyde a couple of weeks from Liverpool and yeah. I think 
you know, the performance against Burnley, second half was much better than the first half, you've got to say, but it, it overall still probably wasn't anywhere near Liverpool's best. Now, there are some caveats to that. They didn't have the first choice keeper. Alison Becker was out with the flu. Joe Gomez, who, you know, I think possibly would have started that game at left back had he been, had he been yeah. um, not struck down with the flu as well. I mean, Andy Robertson, we'll get onto a little bit later, but, you know, I thought really grew into the game, maybe struggled slightly in that first half, but really improved as the game went on. Um, so they had no Joe Gomez. Trent Alexander-Arnold, as we say, was carrying a knock and, and went off at half time. Curtis Jones has to go and, and play it uh, right back. Uh, no Mo Salah, so club's top scorer, the top assister in the league as well. No Dominic Spozlai. Um, Watara Rendo is back from from the, um, the Asia Games and he is, you know, not sort of out of match rhythm, but in terms of playing play for Liverpool, Liverpool yeah. is. Um, and... Yeah, you know, uh, Ibrahim Konate as well, who obviously got sent off against Arsenal. Um, no Connor Bradley. So there were a lot of caveats. Yeah, the list goes on. A lot of caveats um, to maybe why Liverpool weren't at the best. Um, do you think it's worrying or do you think that's a hallmark of champions, the fact they could grind out a result even without being at the best? I mean, if you, if you look at it like in isolation, it's concerning because they did concede a, a lot of chances. And and to be fair to Burnley, I, I, was, I was really impressed with them in, in terms of they kind of stuck to their principles and gave Liverpool a game. And I think early on, I mean, they probably looked at it as it, well, it was a free hit for them, really. I mean, they're 18th in the in the league, 19th, whatever. Um, and they pressed Liverpool really high. And I thought Liverpool kind of looked like they were still hung over from that Arsenal game. Some of the, the, the possession they surrendered was really sloppy. Um, and they and for that first 20 minutes, it looked like Burnley were just going to grab something. Um, but then I think after the, after the first goal and Liverpool put something together, they never really looked, even when they got pegged back as bad as it was, you, you didn't see Burnley scoring another. I mean, their goal came from a set piece, which was kind of like, you know, old Burnley on the dice, wasn't it? But um, yeah, as you said, there was there was loads of caveats to it. But if you look at it in 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 the, the sense of, you know, a ten or fifteen game run or whatever, I think it's. Um, I don't think the performance is too worrying because there's going to be times where Liverpool, you know, have to grind out results. And as you say, it's so cliche, but the, the sign of champions. But you know, you look back to that nineteen twenty season when they did win the league, and you look at Villa away; they didn't play particularly well that afternoon. They 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 get two late goals and they win. Um, you look at Leicester at Anfield; they scored late. There were so many games. I mean, United away; they scored late through Lallana to get a point. So. It at the time it can feel like the end of the world, and especially if, if Burnley score one of those two chances in the second half, it's two two, and the game is is changed. But then I'm probably thinking, well, there's, there's no chance that Liverpool don't score a third, just the way the game was going, and and ultimately it's Darwin Nunes who gets it. But I mean, he has that one near the end as well, where he touches it down and and, and probably should score Liverpool's fourth. So I think you can argue both ways. Um, but I mean, the start was was quite concerning. But I don't think it's anything new from Liverpool. They've been quite slow starters this season, haven't they? Uh, I mean, it feels like that's been going on for a few years now, actually, where yeah. they they don't seem to get a grip of the game right from the off. They're and, very much a second half team. Yeah, exactly. And and I mean, you know. It, it, Clearly, there's a, there's a confidence in people that even when they do go one 0 down, it's it's kind of similar to that title season of like, well, I don't think teams, I don't know, didn't go one 0 down against Burnley, but even when they get pegged back, I don't think teams are thinking right, we've got them here. I think teams are still worried that Liverpool are going to turn it up a notch. Um, but it is just frustrating, isn't it? Because if you kind of offer those chances and surrender those chances to someone like a Manchester City or a Tottenham or whoever, you know, they will punish you. I mean, company said after the game that he'd been here with Man City as obviously as a player and he said he hadn't had as many chances as his Burnley team had had on the afternoon. So I think that kind of just shows you the, 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 the you know, how um, ruinous Burnley were that they, they didn't punish Liverpool, at least with one of those Fafana chances. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think a big part of, of Liverpool's improvement in the second half came down to the introduction of Harvey Elliott. Obviously, an enforced change, as we said earlier on, Curtis Jones goes in to fill in at right back with, with Trent Alexander-Arnold going off. And I will admit, I was, was slightly nervous when I saw that. Not, not you know, any, any sort of um, criticism of Curtis, but just, you know, not yeah. having a recognised right back on the pitch was, was a slightly, uh, slightly nerve-wracking one, particularly as Burnley had played fairly well well in that first half um but yeah Harvey Elliott he comes on gets two assists although I don't know if the second one was taken off him was I it yeah the first one was taken the off first one sorry yeah. yeah um because it came via a deflection which I think is a stupid rule yeah. um say that for another pod <laughs> yeah but um he was he was really really impressive I thought and really sort of took the took the ball by the horns in that second half and I think it, he's a player that comes in for a fair bit of criticism sometimes. And I think, again, maybe similar to, to Ryan Gravenberch, people forget how young he is. He's obviously only 20 years old. And we, we talk a lot you know, about Jarrell Quantzer and how he's come through the ranks this season and Conor Bradley as well. And Harvey Elliott is, in fact, 
uh, younger than both of those. Um, he just doesn't feel like he is because he's been at Liverpool now for five, five, six yeah. years. And, you know, he obviously came in, he was a kid, wasn't he, when he came in from Fulham. And um, he, he's done incredibly well to, to get to where he is. He's only two appearances off now, making 100 appearances for Liverpool. Um, so he's he's on track to, to get there in a, a quicker time than, than Steven Gerrard and Trent Alexander-Arnold. So um, he's a real talent. Um, I don't think we've seen the best of him. I don't think he... I think he, he almost suffers because he is quite a versatile player and yeah. he can play, he obviously can play on the right side of the, that midfield. I think that's probably his best position. He can play on the right wing as well um, in various other positions in midfield. But I think because he has that versatility, I think sometimes you don't quite know what his best position is and he maybe is a victim of that. It feels like he's a fall guy at times. Yeah, he? and he is, is an easy scapegoat, I think, at times. But... Um, I mean, that performance on, on, on Saturday should give him a lot of confidence going forward, shouldn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's been a kind of the theme of Harvey the season. I think I said it on a pod a few few months ago, maybe, that it kind of felt that he'd come off the bench in a Premier League game, do really well. I mean, you think of the, the Wolves game back in September, he changes that game as well, gets a, a goal, I think, right at the end. Then he starts the Europa League game in the midweek and or the you know the League Cup game or whatever game was coming up. He doesn't play that well. And, you know, to be fair to him, he's, he's playing with a almost Liverpool's second team, isn't he? So you've kind of got to take that into account. And then he finds himself back on the bench for, you know, the Premier League game. So it was kind of like a, a you know, a really vicious cycle that he couldn't seem to break um, and I was the same as you Beth when I, when I saw him coming on I was a bit like how was that I know Trent wasn't at his, at his best on, on Saturday I mean he got to get the assist for Jota but apart from that I, I thought he, he, he struggled but um but then, when, as, as you say, you see Jones going to right, but you see Elliot coming on, you're thinking, oh, where's Liverpool's creativity going to come from? But straight away with Elliot, I was really impressed. I mean, he just added, you know, an impetus to the game. He just added a bit of energy. And I think that's what he always brings. I mean, I talked about it in the first half, Liverpool not pressing as high or, you know, being a bit dysfunctional, kind of carrying on that, that hangover from Arsenal. But straight away, um, for, for Liverpool's equaliser, which is, what, five, ten minutes into the second half, Elliot's pressing their left back. And, he, you know, as a result, Liverpool win the ball quite high um, in a position that they didn't do in the first half. I think they, they kind of stood off Burnley at times. And all because of kind of Elliot's willingness and, and, and energy to go and press. I think it break, the ball breaks to Jones and it eventually finds its way to McAllister and then back to Elliot, who's who's in, in that kind of right-hand channel to, to put the ball across to Diaz. So that was almost a goal from his own making that, you know, if, if Liverpool... If, if he wasn't pressing, Burnley probably would have lumped the ball into a channel and then, you know, you're picking the ball up 30 yards deeper. So I think that was that was really good. And and even then, with with Liverpool's third goal, you saw the other side of his game where, he, you know, he's got the the kind of composure. I mean, Jota has that shot and everyone's appealing for a penalty. Everyone's going mad. And, and he kind of takes a touch, gets his head up and kind of caresses a ball to the back post where, you know, it's a really good finish from Nunes, but the cross is, I think, really brilliant. It, it kind of goes above everyone, but lands right at Nunes' head, not, you know, not from a far distance either. Um so yeah, I was I was really impressed with Elliot, and I think it was something he needed um, because it felt like those cameos, as I say, they have been a the theme of his season, but he hasn't had one in a while. And I think you know going into the, to the business end of the season, Liverpool are going to need all players. Um, you know whether that be in the cup final, the FA Cup, Europa League, they're going to need all their players kind of singing from the same hymn sheet and and you know in a rich vein of form. And, and certainly if you've got players like Elliot and Jones in, you know for the second half, if you think in, in not his usual position, it, it bodes really well for Liverpool. Yeah, and just to touch on someone who was playing alongside Elliot in midfield Alexis McAllister I mean we spoke earlier on about how good he was well how, best of a bad bunch wasn't he really against Arsenal um, and I think you know a lot a lot of people this season have, have really wanted him to play further forward and play maybe as a, as a number eight um, but I thought it was quite interesting on Saturday because he, he played in that more advanced role with Wataru Rando behind him and actually struggled a little bit and it was actually in the second half when he dropped you know five ten yards deeper that he started to be able to dictate play I mean my favourite thing is one of my favourite players in this in this Liverpool side, this new look Liverpool side, because he's so intelligent. Um, and I've said that quite a few times before. I think he's, he's just such a joy to watch, the same way that Roberto Firmino was, in the sense that you, you always felt that he was one step ahead of a lot of yeah. people around him on the pitch. Um, his ability to, to sort of spray the ball out in, in all directions... Um, is is incredible and has been key at times to sort of help in Liverpool bypass you know low blocks and, and things you like that. Just give me Thiago back. Yeah. Not to make it about Thiago because that's. <laughs> we'll get on to Thiago to, to later on. By, but I, I think he does. I don't know about you, but he does yeah, remind me Thiago. That immense quality and that ability to, di to dictate play for it from deep. I think he definitely does share that with Thiago. Um, do you think? I, I don't think he necessarily struggled. I think struggles may be a little bit harsh, but he he was he was better playing a little bit deeper, yeah. wasn't he? Do you think? 
long term do you keep him as a six or do you think Liverpool now wait for Wataru Renzo to, to maybe get back up to form or, or go into the transfer market in the summer for a six what do you think is, is going to be his long term best position for Liverpool it's difficult isn't it because I think Endo was I mean it would have been a great opportunity for him but it felt like that, that Asia Cup came at the wrong time mm-hmm. for him he was on a, a really nice kind of trajectory of form wasn't he obviously played against United played against Arsenal was, was probably the best player in, the, in that United game um, and then he kind of loses that momentum and, and Liverpool kind of I know, I know, Macarthur just come back from injury, uh, but Liverpool kind of grown without him again. So he kind of faces that. Um, he's he's kind of got to come back around and prove himself almost for a second time uh, this season. But um, I, th- I think with, when Endo signed, it was clearly a stopgap solution. I would be surprised if you know. I think he'll be at Liverpool next season, but I'd be surprised if he's if he's not a Europa League or a cup player. Um, whether that's because Trent Alexander Arnold is you know Liverpool's number six, or because Alexis McAllister is, or they're going by someone else, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I think it you know will obviously largely depend on on which manager comes through the door. But I think McAllister, as as you say, I was kind of one of those clamouring to see him to see, see him go further forward. But I think just before Christmas, he got on a similarly kind of a, a nice patch, didn't he? Where I know, as I say, he got injured in that game against Sheffield United, but before that, it, it felt like he was coming to the boil and and probably playing the best football he's played since since moving to Liverpool. Um, but then I think in the the first half against. Burnley, it was 27 touches he had, which was which was really, you know, by his kind of standards, was was really poor, and it felt like he, he you know, he's been Liverpool's metronome, hasn't he? Especially when Trent isn't kind of on song, and and when he's not involved, whether the, whether because Burnley are so compact or Arsenal are so compact, whatever, it just felt like Liverpool just didn't do anything to the kind of the right notes, um, and that was that was shown in their attacking play. I don't I don't think it was as precise or as fluid as it as it has been when McAllister is you know all singing or dancing. Um, so I, I think as you say in the second half when he when they almost became like a, a, a double pivot, didn't they with uh, Endo and, and McAllister? Um, I just think Liverpool looked a lot better. But part of that will, will also have been that Burnley um, will have dropped off a bit as well. I mean, there was no way they could have matched that tempo for 90 minutes. So it all of a sudden does become a bit easier for Liverpool to find gaps and find spaces and, and McAllister to pick up the ball. Um, but I think I think long term, I think he is probably going to be the, the man at the base of Liverpool's midfield, as I say. If, whether that's alongside Trent Alexander or Arnold, I'm not sure. But I think if Liverpool are to, to win the big games, win the big trophies this year, that it will be with McAllister. Yeah, I would agree. Maybe even Thiago making a little cameo <laughs> alongside him as well. Um, one of, I think, the most positive things to come out of that game on Saturday was each of Liverpool's front three bagged themselves a goal. We'll get onto that a little bit in, in more detail in a minute. Um, I just want to have a little look at some of the comments that we've got on YouTube. Um, we've had one from Spit Roasted Penguin, who was uh, was commenting yesterday. Hi, Spit Roasted Penguin. Um, he said... Or she, sorry, sorry to assume that that spit roasted penguin is a man. Um, Liverpool give up way too many chances to win the league, in my opinion. I can see Tony putting a massive dent in our title chances. Let's hope not. This weekend we could be third by this time next week. It's not very positive from spit roasted penguin, is it? Um, Richard Huntington says, "Where is Bacetic, Thiago, Matip, Alison Gomez, Simakas, Salah, Dokes, Abazlay, and Bradley?" Um, I mean, I feel like. The, the length of that list probably indicates, you know, just how well Liverpool have done to cope these last few weeks. Yeah. I mean, um, obviously, t- I think Alisson is is back in training today, Gomez as well, um, hopefully recovered from the flu. Simicast, we obviously saw him come on um, against Burnley, which was nice, a bit of a, un- a bit of a welcome surprise, rather. Um, Salah, hopefully back in, in the not-too-distant future, so Bosley as well. Bradley, hopefully. Um, I think Doak, Pachetic, obviously Matip's out for the season. Um, and Thiago might take a little bit longer, but we will. We live in hope. Um, Richard also says, is Xabi Alonso coming or not? Um, I mean, I feel like that's a whole topic for another podcast, so we, we, we'll, um, we, won't, we won't go into that now, but we did talk about that a little bit yesterday on, on yesterday's Blood Red podcast, so go and check that one out, Richard. Um, we've got someone else saying, we need to win the next four games going into the City game. I would probably agree with that. I don't think Liverpool can afford... To, to give City a sniff really going into that game at Anfield. Um, and let's see what else we've got. Um, oh, a more positive one here from Haven. Oh, there's a league to be won. Keep going, Reds. We're all behind you. That's the kind of positivity we can get behind. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, as you say, it's a, a busy couple of weeks, isn't it, until we play City. I mean, there's a league cup final before them. Obviously, I think Brentford will be difficult of the, of the weekend. The Liverpool haven't, haven't won there before, and it just feels like... I think Burnley had a bit of luck in the second half, didn't they? With some of the long balls they played, they had. I mean, I know they they were really nice on the eye in the first half, but it felt like some of the chances they created in the second were just long punts, and I just worry about that. Um, 
with Ivan Tony and that Visser up top. I mean, they have caused Liverpool problems in the past before, um, and certainly last season. You know, Liverpool lose three one there. The season before then was that manic three three, wasn't it? In, in the opening weeks of the season, so that's the, the kind of one that I've circled as a potential banana skin. But then you're looking at Luton and and Forest away. I mean, that'll be another tough one. But you, you really do think Liverpool have to get nine from nine before that? I, I don't know what you think, Beth. Yeah, I think I think Liverpool should win all of those games, but we know from sort of the past couple of seasons that. Liverpool maybe tend to slip and slip up in those games that that they don't you know that they're expected to win. So we we will see. I mean, hopefully they, you know, they'll have a few more players back, a few more bodies back, and that will give them a little bit of impetus to go on and, and go into that City game on a on a on a winning run. Um, just going back then to to Liverpool's forward line against Burnley. Um, someone I wanted to just touch on quickly was Diogo Jota. Six goals and three assists now since he came back from injury on Boxing Day. and um, That's a run that puts him on course for his most productive scoring season in a Liverpool shirt. His previous best was 21 goals across all competitions. That was in the season Liverpool went close to, to a quadruple in, in 21-22. Um, 14 goals and three assists in all competitions so far this season. I mean, he is... He's a he's probably one of the most underrated signings that Liverpool have made under Jurgen Klopp, isn't he? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he's just a jack of all trades in in terms of he can do absolutely everything across the front line. And I know that a lot has been made of, of that. Sometimes he kind of drifts through games. I think there was a piece in the Times from from Paul Joyce last week that said that he'd been nicknamed the Ghost at Liverpool because of his ability to to kind of almost do nothing or not contribute, not get a touch, and then he pops up at the back post with you know a game breaking goal. So I, I think that's fair. But I also I actually wrote a piece, I think, two or three months ago, and I said that that goal drought that he went on, and I know that he was injured for a lot of that time, but I think that goal drought really helped him improve his overall game, and I think we are seeing that now. His link-up is becoming a lot better. Um, his pressing off the ball is becoming a, a lot more efficient, and, OK, it wasn't there at the Emirates, but he really does harry defenders, doesn't he? And he's, he, it just feels like he's, he's coming to the boil as a Liverpool player now, as you say, you know, 21 goals in that 21-22 season. Still doesn't start the Champions League final. So you've got Sadio Mane, Luis Diaz had come in and done really well in those opening months as, as a Liverpool player. And then you've got Mo Salah. So he would have been really disappointed with that time. And it, and even in the summer, there was, you know, rumours that he, he could be off and people were saying, well, you know, if we got 50 million quid for him, I'd, I'd probably take it. And I remember just thinking that, like, it's just absolutely nuts that people would, would happily cash in on him. And, you know, you look at some of the fees that, I, you know, get, kind of thrown around for big strikes. You look at Harry Kane, 100 million quid. You look at, you know, what it's going to take to to, to buy Mbappe. I know he'll probably go on a free, but, you know, in, in terms of wages, it's, it's going to be up there over a five, six-year contract. You look at Erlen Haaland as well. And Liverpool have got, you know, OK, he's not not in that same category as, you know, Yer Mbappe, Yer Haaland, Yer Kane, but I wouldn't, I, I would maybe say he's one or two below. Um, and I think he's, as I say, he's, he's such a great player because he can play on the left, he can play on the right, he can play down the middle. And, Certainly during Salah's time at Afcon, it looks like he's really stepped up to the mantle. Well, he has really stepped up to the mantle. It looks like he's really enjoying and, and kind of relishing that that um, that vacant position as Liverpool's, you know, not Egyptian king, but but lad from Portugal, <laughs> if you want to call it that. So, I've I've been really pleased with him and those kind of goals against Chelsea. Um, that goal against Chelsea, sorry, it, it felt like that was a really crowning moment for him because it was, you know, another big goal and another big game for Jota. And I felt like people were then slowly starting to sit back and say, actually, he's on a really good run here. And he's another player where you think if Liverpool are going to win things this season, it's going to be down to his goals. And, and you know, it's not that he just scores goals. He scores important goals, as I say. Um, loads of his goals since he's joined the club have been been openers. They've been they've been winners. They've been, you know, to take a game from 2-1 to 3-1. So, uh, yeah, I really do like Jota. And I'm kind of glad that he's getting his, his plaud. It's that like he, he really does deserve. Yeah, and probably, you know, takes the prize for the, the most scouse looking Portuguese person <laughs> to, to ever exist as well. Um and, and it was nice as well for, for Luis Diaz to get in on, on the action on, on Saturday and at Darwin Nunes. Um we won't go into too much detail on, on either of those because we spoke about that yesterday on, on Blood Red, but um but just nice to see that the goals are being shared across that forward line and, and both Diaz and Nunes may be in need of a little bit of confidence. So so nice for them to get on the score sheet, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean Diaz is a is a, a difficult one as you need to assess because you know, he had such an electric start to life at Liverpool two, two, three years ago, whenever it was, 2022. He comes in and, as I say, straight away, League Cup finally, he benches Jota, FA Cup finally starts as well, Champions League finals as well. So Jota's all of a sudden gone from being, you know, one of Liverpool's marksmen that season to all of a sudden finding himself as, like, you know, the, the 12th man. So that that kind of just shows the level of Diaz's impact. And obviously last year he got the knee injury, so he missed a lot of football. And even when he returned at the end of the season, it was clear that that was in, with this season in mind. He was just kind of getting minutes in his legs again and just getting confident on the ball. And, you know, he had a few decent performances 
you know, I think he scored against Tottenham and whatnot. But really, we we haven't really seen that Diaz. I don't think until until recently. Really, um, that game at the start of the year against Newcastle, um, you know, at the start of January, I thought was was probably his best performance of the season. And since then, he has kind of kicked on. He gets the winner at Arsenal in the FA Cup, um, and he's. I mean, as I say he struggled last week against Arsenal, as I think they all did. Um, but it does just feel that goal against Burnley was just one to kind of kick him in the right direction. And, and I think we've been really critical. I know Klopp was certainly not really critical. Critical is probably the wrong word. But I think last year, before his injury, Klopp did call him to improve his numbers. Um, you know, you look at who Liverpool were losing, Sadio Mane, and he was, you know, kind of similar, really. When he was at Southampton, he wasn't the most efficient forward man, was he? But he kind of really upped his numbers when he came to Liverpool. And I think everyone was hoping that Diaz would, would follow that same trajectory. And it, and it feels like, I'm not sure what you think, Beth, but it feels like he is kind of on that way now to being more productive in front of goal. He's getting between the posts and he's he's scoring decisive goals, um, which, you know, is only going to be good news for Liverpool, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, he's a player that is, is very much considered sort of a wide man, isn't he? But a lot of his goals have actually come from inside you know, inside the, the goalpost, which is is nice because it shows you that he is getting into those positions. And again, it was nice to see him getting across the getting across the goal. I mean, I'm just looking at his, his stats here for this season: nine goals and three assists in all competitions. I mean, that's not a bad return to, to be at in February, is it? So, um, hopefully, plenty more to come over the next few weeks. Um, just looking ahead, then. I mean, we've had quite a few comments about Chelsea hitting form at, at a pretty uh, a pretty unfortunate time for Liverpool in terms of the, the Carabao Cup final, which is obviously on the on the 25th of February. Um, Liverpool blighted by injury, although hopefully some of those players will be back by then. Um, do you think injuries are going to play a big part over a decisive few weeks? Uh, well, I think so for both teams. I was reading this morning that Pochettino thinks that Thiago Silva will, will potentially be out of that one. I think they're already missing one or two centre centre as well. I think Badia Shire is, is out. Levi Cole, Cole missed a game last week. So um, it'll be interesting to see you know, what players Chelsea line up with because, you know, even when I look at a Chelsea team sheet at the minute, there's not many players that I do recognise from being, you know, completely truthful. They've just spent that that much money, haven't they? And there's you know, it is a young team and it's an inexperienced team, but as you say, they are quietly finding form. I think prior to that game at Anfield they were I think the the third most informed side in the Premier League. So it, you know, they, it kind of has gone under the radar because of all the talk about Pochettino. It feels like, you know, it, it's kind of one stream, one extreme to another. You know, they win a game and it's like, right, Chelsea are going to you know, make a charge for, you know, European football or whatever. And then they lose a game and it's like, who's going to replace Pochettino? Um, so it does feel quite volatile, Chelsea, at the minute. And very fragile, that 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 project, if you want to call it that, what, what they're building. Um, but, I mean, as I say, as much for Chelsea, it'll be Liverpool as well because I think their injury list has probably gone under the radar as well. I mean, I know Liverpool haven't played much with Thiago this season, but I think everyone was looking at um, you know this running and thinking if you can kind of get him back, you know, get him in for a final. That that's you know it's kind of a luxury player to have, which is is what Thiago should be for Liverpool at this this, this stage of his career. Um, you're also looking at Salah. You know, is he going to make his return against Brentford? If not, then he's only going to have like two two games before the final or one game and then the final. Um, and then, you know, you've got to see what happens with Trent because, as we touched on earlier, you know, if, if Trent Alexander-Arnold isn't in the team, that completely changes how Liverpool plays. It, it changes who's the kind of creative nucleus and it puts an onus on other players. And especially for a young lad like Conor Bradley, who's, you know, made less than 20 appearances for Liverpool, for him to then go out at, at Wembley, you know, as I say, OK, it's a young Chelsea team, but, you know, they've got, they've got some expensive players in that lineup. I mean, they've got, you know, 50 million, 60 million, 70 million quid forward. So, yeah, I think injuries... I don't want to say it'll be determined on injuries, but I think they will have a significant impact on on who who wins the trophy. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned Thiago there. I know you are a big fan of him. A massive fan. <laughs> um, as I am as well. I think when he's when he's at his best and when he's fully fit, he's incredible. But Liverpool, unfortunately, haven't seen that. I mean, one stat that um, that our colleague Paul Ghost. Um, brought up the other day was that since Thiago's last start from Liverpool for Liverpool, um, which was against Wolves in that three three nil defeat at Molyneux in last February, Klopp side have played five thousand and forty minutes across all competitions. Thiago is featured for just hundred and one of those, with ninety six of them coming towards the back end of last season as short cameos. So he really hasn't contributed, has he, over over the past twelve months, which is a shame. Um you never know but this injury couldn't be might might not be as bad as first feared. He he might still have a, a decisive part to play in the running, um, but pretty safe to, to assume that he won't be involved in the next few weeks. Um, well, that's it for, for, for from us for today. Um, we'll be back in it in a couple of weeks' time, by which point Liverpool will hopefully have, have beaten Brentford away, beaten Luton away, uh, beaten Luton at home rather, sorry, um, and have a, 
a trophy as well that will uh, that propel them onto to greater heights for the rest of the season. But thank you very much for listening. We've been analysing Anfield and we'll see you soon.